And I think we're going to move on to our health committee update. Yes, thank you, members of the board. You have um, approved Jody Bailey as associate principal of Springfield Park Elementary School. The next item is our health committee update. And before we begin that, I just want to take a moment to reiterate to our community our unwavering commitment to return to in-person instruction for students who chose that option. As most of you know, we have since September been serving students in select groups, including special education, English learners, pre-K, and high school career and technical education for limited in-person opportunities in our schools. We understand the importance of in-person learning and we continue to strive towards bringing more students back for these critically important face-to-face -face learning experiences. Our ongoing efforts to ensure that we are responsive to our students' academic and social emotional well-being led us and this board to vote in October on a timeline for bringing more students into our classrooms for in-person learning. The pauses, delays, and changes in plans since then have been hard on all of our stakeholders, our students foremost, our families, our staff. The road to where we get the road to where we are today has been arduous. It has been an ever-changing one. We were firm in our message that we communicated about our timeline to our families for returning to in-person on January 5th, that timeline we communicated on January 5th. But the next day, we learned officially in a governor's announcement that school staff would be included in Group 1B for vaccinations. And soon after that, we heard the incredibly positive news from the dedicated teams, both in county government and our local health department, about collaborative efforts to undertake this effort in an expedited manner. In a pandemic where information changes almost daily, this imminent availability of vaccines for our staff was simply unknown at the time we set our timeline on January 5th. While we knew that vaccines were a future possibility, we did not expect them so soon. But how fortunate we are to live in a place where this kind of teamwork and dedication to our schools and community exists. Given this new and very promising development, we revised our timeline for expanded in-person learning, understanding that while all of the logistics about what would come next with the vaccination effort were unknown, getting through the vaccinating of phase one expeditiously is a shared priority. I once more humbly ask for patience and forgiveness from those of you who have opted to return their students in person and showed tremendous confidence in our health risk mitigation planning. I share your heartache, your frustration over the continuous delays to our timelines. And I know how very important it is for our students to have access to in-person learning. Let there be no doubt about the overwhelming good that will come from getting through vaccinating all of phase one expeditiously. This is a tremendously positive step for the entire Henrico community. More vaccinations as quickly as possible means less spread in our own community and sets us all on a path towards getting back to normal in all aspects of our life, including school. We will now hear from our health committee with updates on this effort and what's next. Dr. Teigen. Share my screen. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board and Dr. Cashwell. Ms. Robin Gilbert, the Supervisor of School Health Services, and I are here again today to share an update from the HCPS Health Committee. Dr. Veray, our friend is from the Health Department, is also here on the line to answer any technical questions related to the current health metrics or the vaccinations. The Health Committee has met weekly for the past three weeks. After each meeting, our superintendent was updated. After last Monday's meeting, the division leadership team was updated and discussed next steps. The local and regional data was reviewed and the two core indicators related to community spread continue to be at the highest risk category as we looked at them this past Monday. The number of new cases per 100,000 persons within the last 14 days was 827. 
That was Monday. On Tuesday, today, that number is down slightly at 818.8. The percent positivity for the last 14 days was at 13.9% on Monday, and today it is marginally less at 13.8%. While we have put an equal emphasis on the three core indicators, recent guidance from our health professionals is for schools to put a much greater emphasis on the ability of our schools to implement the five key mitigation strategies that are a part of the third core indicator. While we know community spread is high, we know we have not had outbreaks resulting from spread between adults and students and students and adults. This is after many months of having over a thousand students in our schools for limited in-person learning, and then additional students in our schools for childcare. At the January 4th Henrico County Public Schools Health Committee meeting, Dr. Avula stated he was not aware of another school system who has invested what Henrico has to ensure the safety of staff and students. His confidence in our mitigation efforts were strong. In addition to reviewing the health metrics, the health committee reviewed student progress data as well. During first quarter, we saw an increase in the number of students across all grade levels who have missed five or more days of school since the start of the year. And also when looking at student progress, we saw that the number of students failing one or more classes had also increased across all grade levels. The mental health data from the Henrico Area Mental Health and Developmental Services on access to youth and family services continues to show an increase in access with the crisis intervention team indicating that there's been a decrease in referrals. This increase in community mental health access and lower referral rates internally is concerning. While the school-based mental health teams continue to provide for students' mental health needs, needed referrals may not be occurring due to the decrease in face-to-face -face interaction. Many students do not turn on their cameras during classroom instruction, making it impossible for teachers to evaluate where students are. Overall, while some students are thriving in the virtual world, others are struggling. And this aligns with the feedback we have see, received from families since the start of the school year. As you may recall, as Dr. Cashwell just shared, um, on Tuesday, January 5th, we shared our timeline to return to school. And then on Wednesday, January 6th, the governor announced school staff would be considered essential workers and be included in group 1B immunizations. This was new and exciting news. Later that week, the county reached out to schools to begin planning for what, would, what it would look like for Henrico County. The true impact was unknown and we adjusted our timeline to assist with the efforts and provide staff with access to the vaccine. And the only constant seemed to be change, rapid change. We adjusted our timeline to assist with uh, efforts and provide staff access to vaccinations. We anticipated these efforts would impact our timeline and wanted to be transparent with our families. So where are we now? Henrico will be going into phase 1B on Monday, January 18th, and the health department, county and schools are currently working feverishly to prepare for the first immunization events in Henrico next week. Tuesday evening, I learned the Regional Incident Management Team, or IM, Regional IMT as it's referred to, was being reformed to provide greater collaboration for the immunization process, thus lessening the impact on our school staff. Still, about half of our nurses will be assisting with the immunization efforts next week during the day and possibly evenings. Specifically, they will be assisting on February 20th, 21st, and 22nd of next week, while the others remain in schools to support our students participating in limited in-person instruction. Days for nurses to assist the following week have not been determined. As you can imagine, the immunization administration process is still evolving as needed 
along the way. The one thing, though, that has not changed is the counties and the health department's support of schools and making our staff a priority in the immunization process. The health department has asked all employers to prioritize front public student facing employees first from the lens of increased face to face exposure and an inability to telework and are relying on us as employers to determine who those individuals are. We are working through this process, but we are hoping the efforts of the regional incident management team um, to hold max, mass vaccination events where the county is prioritizing our employees will hopefully be able to accommodate our staff in a very quick fashion. Our staff was surveyed on Monday and Tuesday of this week to determine the preliminary numbers of immunization dosages needed. The survey provided access to a Virginia Department of Health town hall presentation that had been shared last Friday afternoon to key health liaisons in the various public and private schools in the Richmond area. We wanted them to have some basis from which to decide how likely they were to participate in the immunization process. The next steps include holding a Henrico Health Department led town hall meeting for our staff to provide information about the vaccine and answer questions. And we will be providing our staff with the date, time, location, and registration process for immunization. Because as you can see from our data, we had a considerable number of staff wanting to participate. Now, not all staff responded to the survey as it was a um, quick turnaround. However, we are far above the national average of about 50 to 60% that chose to participate um, in the phase 1A immunization process. And so we know that some that school employees will begin as they are a priority next Wednesday and continue immunization through Friday. If needed, the regional IMT plan is to hold an additional vaccination event on Saturday, January 23rd. I know I've received questions about which vaccine staff will receive and what we've been told is the expectation is it will be the Moderna vaccine. With this vaccine, the first injection starts the body's building of antibodies. During the first two weeks post injection, this is estimated to build a 50% coverage. The second vaccine is given four weeks after the initial shot and requires two weeks after administration to reach full effectiveness, which is reported to be 95% effectiveness. The logistics to potentially immunize 6,000 or more HCPS staff members, including full-time and part-time staff, temporary employees, and PrEP participants is a massive undertaking. Again, we have 73.4% of our staff that have responded that they are likely or very likely to participate in the vaccination process. Total, we had a total of 5,925 of our 10,158 staff that responded to the survey. As we work to collaborate with Henrico County to immunize those who want to be immunized, schools continue to work to fill vacancies for various temporary positions. We are currently short 30 clinic aides out of 62 positions. This number has decreased by two in the last day. HR is working with schools to get these positions filled as soon as possible. The health committee decided to continue to meet weekly for the foreseeable future. So our next meeting will be on Tuesday, January 19th, as Monday, January 18th is a, is a holiday. 
And again, as Dr. Cashwell indicated, the recommendation would be for the school board to have a discussion at the January 28th meeting when we can provide an update on the immunization process and progress and have a discussion about next steps in our timeline moving forward. And at this point, Ms. Gilbert, Dr. Veray, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have regarding the health committee update or the immunization process. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute. Um, I'll start with Ms. Atkins. Do you have any questions for Dr. Tigan or the team? Thank you, uh, Dr. Tigan, for that update. I know that you shared that we'll get additional information on the 28th regarding the process very quickly. I did want to ask, um, you know, as far as the process goes, my understanding is just for the patient or any individual, they come in, they get their the shot, uh, and then they are monitored for a certain period of time. And then they will receive a card or some sort of notification when to come back. On the 28th, I would hope that we can define exactly what the nurse role and responsibilities are, and particularly just to better understand that we want to ensure that while we're having a great partnership, and that's what this is going to take, it's also important to understand the specific role that our nurses are going to play because it is a, a lengthy process and whether their particular role is going to be to give the shot under physician's care, if their role is going to be to monitor for adverse conditions after getting the shot, et cetera. So I'm just sharing that because that would be my expectation on the 28th to hear more about that. I would also want to better understand from that sort of the clinical side of the house, but from the administrative side of the house, I'd want to better understand how it's organized from a claims perspective and also better understand who's paying for the services. So I don't know if the nurses will still be under Henrico County Public Schools or will they sort of be employees of the health department? That's again, more on the administrative side of the house because they would need to be under a physician to disseminate these vaccines. So these are some of the, the answers to, you know, that I would expect, you know, on the 28th. So I'm going to pause <laughs> to allow my colleagues to, to ask their most, pro, you know, priority questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Reverend Cooper, I'll let you go next. Yeah, thank you, um, um, doc, um, Dr. Tigan, for the update in regards to current status and basically, you know, where we are until um, our next meeting in regards to. So, you know, I will be looking forward to receiving, you know, what 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 the metrics are and, and with with the next steps. And so I look forward to hearing that, that dialogue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Kintella. Um, yes, I'm just going to um, thank you again, Dr. Tiger, for the presentation. I'll try to move us along as quickly as possible. Um, will teachers and staff with accommodations who receive the vaccine still be able to teach virtually? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Participation and, in the vaccination won't impact, um, you know, their accommodations. Okay. And then do we expect the plan for fall or spring sports to change? No, ma'am. The, the intent is for the fall and, you know, subsequent and spring sport sports to go on as planned. Specifically, fall is the next one coming up. In, on the first week in February, but we expect it to go on as planned. With following okay. our, I be very clear that it's following our our health plan specifically around athletics. Okay, thank you for that. Um, were vaccinations originally part of the expanded return to in-person plan in October? I think Dr. Cashwell covered that, but I'm not sure. No, ma'am, they were not a part of it. We were had no indication as to when that vaccine would actually be available for anyone, much less um, staff. I'm not sure. Did I not Is she cutting that answer the question? Yes, yes, it did. I'm, I'm just wondering if you're cutting it out for my colleagues as well, because my sound went in and out. 
Um, is our school funding or will our school funding be tied to the decision and rollout of the expansion of in-person learning? We have received no indication from the VDOE or anyone that we would be, the funding would be impacted at this point. Okay, and then, um, let me see, you can answer that. Um, is there any current consideration or mention anywhere in our policy, because I couldn't find it, of any virtual buffer time uh, when we return from spring break? No, ma'am, there's been no discussion around, um, you know, uh, the week the week after spring break and you know i would anticipate though that the vaccine you know if our staff has been vaccinated that that would probably not be something that would come be a recommendation but i can't speak for the the whole committee okay well i just wanted to bring it forward because that's um those i've heard that in uh, telephone conversations and email um I've heard from staff and bus drivers about students who might not follow the guidelines when we do return to in-person. Um, can you tell me uh, where are these expectations addressed for students? Yes, ma'am. We um, the, There was a code of conduct addendum that was passed by the board um, earlier than in the fall. And it was when students opted for in-person learning, that was part of what they signed and agreed to, was adhering to the requirements for wearing masks on buses in, in the classrooms in schools. Okay, thank you for that. And then I have a question about the secondary calendar. Are the two asynchronous days at the end of the quarter still asynchronous for secondary? Yes, ma'am. They would stay asynchronous. Those days were at the end of the nine weeks and the semester. And the additional need for being asynchronous was to set up their classrooms. And we would expect okay. that they would still do that and be prepared for the return of students. Okay. In the interest of time, I'll, um, I'll yield the floor. Thank you so much, Dr. Tigan. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you, Dr. Tigan. Uh, Mrs. Shea? Yeah, let me know if I start. Mine's been freezing and coming in and out. So if I cut out, let me know. All right. Um, Dr. Tigan, can you share with me what the impact of utilizing our nurses are on the community health line timeline? So if we didn't assist to help expedite this community health timeline, what would those impacts be? I don't know that I can quantify the impact. I know that right, you know, the um, our county doesn't have nurses. I mean, most most localities don't have nurses, even if they have an uh, an employee wellness center or something like that, or a health clinic for their employees. They just don't have the the number of staff. And um, as or as late as this morning in the news, you know, some of the stories were about the need of localities to draw on the um, school nurses because that's where the majority of available nurses are. Other nurses, if they're working in healthcare, are are tied up at this time as well. So, it, you know, while I can't quantify it, I mean, it's definitely something that's within, that is a conversation out, not only in Henrico, but outside Henrico. And I can, uh, hi, can you hear me? Hi, it's yes. Melissa Bray from Dr. the Bray. Health District. Hi. Um, Melissa Bray from Health District. I would just like to add that even today on the governor's press conference regarding, you know, not just vaccination, but other things, other things, he, and it, as he has been doing, he put out the call, we need every av available clinician. If we really want to get vaccine into arms as fast as it needs to happen, we are needing to mobilize as many people who can vaccinate as we possibly can. So even as we are you know, working on getting EMTs able to vaccinate, making sure that we're enabling our pharmacies to have vaccine to vaccinate. Anyone with the number of vaccinations that we have to have in between now and the summer, we're trying to bring out as many as we possibly can so that we can get as much vaccine in arms so that we can get to herd immunity. 
So really it is, it's a statewide call. Thank you. Uh, my apologies a little bit on my delay. I'm having some uh, connectivity issues over here. Um, uh, so, um, so as we look at this ballpark estimation, uh, by the way, Ms. Ogburn, do we need to pause to officially do the? We actually do. I was gonna, okay. I, I was, um, we do have a public hearing uh, planned at five that was supposed to start five minutes ago. I'm going to, um, just, we'll just pause in our, our agenda and we'll get right back to it because this is obviously a very important topic. Um, but I'm just, does anyone know if we have any speakers for our 530 public hearing? We do not. Because I'm wondering whether we need to read the script and go through the whole thing if we don't have any speakers. Um, Megan says yes. We do. Okay. So I will. Yeah, the next that. item on the agenda is the public hearing to solicit public input for the proposed revisions to our 2018 to 2025 strategic plan. Some citizens may have signed up in advance with the school board clerk. Uh, Mrs. Harris, do we have anyone signed up? No? Okay, thank you. We will follow that list first, which there is not one. We ask that any speakers who have arrived to come to the laptop set up in the back of the auditorium, use the microphone, clearly state your name or neighborhood or school affiliation. Once you finish speaking, we ask that you write your name and contact information on the sign-in form located on the table in the back of the auditorium. Uh, due to health concerns, hand sanitizer is provided. To assist you in tracking your time, there is a timekeeping system and speakers will have three minute time limit. The light will be green as you begin remarks. The yellow light means you have one minute remaining. We ask that you stop speaking when the light turns red. The school board is here tonight to hear from anyone who would like to speak on the strategic plan and speakers should speak directly to the board. Uh, we appreciate any attendance tonight and the input. And uh, do we have any speakers for the strategic plan? Come one, come all. Madam Chair, there are no speakers present. Okay, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, we have a our next public hearing at uh, 6 p.m. to um, have input on redistricting. So what we will do is we will go back to our discussion on the health committee and pause at 6 for the um, public hearing. So this is Shay, feel free to continue. Thank you. Okay, so um, Dr. Tygen, when we look at um, vaccinating our staff, uh, how many days do we anticipate the first dose to a single dose to take? Like what are, how many days are we talking? Well, and maybe, maybe Dr. Bray is better one to address this. I'm happy to if she, but I would think to having a medical professional, Dr. Bray. I, I guess I'm wondering, or um, were you speaking about how many, how long it would take to get through all the nurses we have signed up? Or, sorry. No, I, I think she was talking about immunization, like the timeline of with the Madeira vaccine, you know, the first shot. Oh, correct. sure. Right, all right. Mrs. Yeah. Shea, I, I think your question was really how many people, like in a day, can. Yeah, so it, no, wow. do we anticipate it taking four days to do our staff? Do we anticipate it taking two weeks to do our staff in terms of actually administering Dr. the vaccine? Judge Tigan, I can help you with that. Um, I believe we received or we're anticipating having in hand somewhere around 3,500 doses um, to start off with of the Moderna vaccine. Um, we have starting off 32 vaccinators for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, working in two shifts starting at eight in the morning and going till eight at night. And a vaccinator can give approximately 10 vaccines per hour. So hoping that 320 vaccines will get given each, each hour that, that we're there for the 12 hours all three days. I will add that the one thing that the one the one limiting factor that everyone is subject to um, beyond the nurses, beyond all of the staff, beyond all of the logistics is we have to get the vaccine from the federal government. So as long as we get as what we ordered, 
that, that's the one caveat I'll give about all everything with vaccination is as long as we are able to get allocated what we have requested, then 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 those numbers should be solid. Um, the one, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I put that out there. Awesome, and, I appreciate that. I, I gave, I just, want ahead, I just want to clarify too, that while teachers are, um, our teachers have access this next week, um, our Henrico firefighters, paramedics, they also have access to this window of time um, for their vaccinations. Um, I gave the analogy to when I was talking to a constituent earlier today work. It's kind of like a rope. You know, there's a lot of levels of red tape uh, in in the government agencies up the ladder from where we are that this vaccine has to come down to. And we're kind of like the end of the rope. And if uh, somebody higher up than we do jerks it, you know, we kind of get flung around. And so I understand that, you know, we're this is provided that everything ahead of us you know, happens like it, it should. So if it's going to take, I don't know, uh, let's say four to five days of vaccination of, uh, of for our employees. Um, and then you said that after two, for since we are getting the um, Moderna vaccine instead of the Pfizer vaccine, we get 50% effectiveness after two weeks, correct? Yeah, that 50 percent effectiveness should you should start getting the effectiveness at two weeks and by four weeks you should be at 50 percent somewhere in that two to four weeks at four weeks you get the second vaccine and two weeks after that we expect you to be at 95 percent efficacy and that would be um the total of six weeks from your first shot all right. And that reason is why, and that's a really big reason why we we really want folks to go through both ser the whole series as much as possible. Or I know that some folks are just thinking they'll get one and that'll be enough, but we really are encouraging folks to go all the way through. Dr. Veray, can you briefly uh, talk to us uh, very briefly about the shift in the focus to the uh, in-school mitigation strategies as opposed to community spread mm -hmm. for our metrics? Sure. I think there are a couple of different things that have come up, and you said briefly, right? <laughs> um, what we'll talk. What we've seen is that a um, couple of things. Number one is that where there was an MMWR article that came out recently ugh, about about school exposures in Mississippi that looked at that found that what was more important or where these kids were getting their infections, these under 18s wasn't as long as there was mask wearing and mitigation going on in the schools where they were getting infected wasn't in school. It was all the stuff around school or it was in instances where there wasn't very good mask wearing. In addition, if you look at what we're talking about in terms of the out, the where we're looking at our outbreaks, even in Henrico, we're not seeing transmission occurring in classrooms with mitigation. We're seeing introductions from teachers or students acquiring it outside or from outside activities, but not in school procedures. So all of these things, kind of all of these data points coming together are just really suggesting that regardless of what's going on, it's not regardless, it's definitely not regardless, the stronger determinant of whether you're going to have school, um, school based transmission, yes, this community transmission just increases the probability that you're gonna get an introduction but the in-school mitigation is what prevents that introduction from going anywhere. So it's really the bigger, the bigger barrier, regardless of what your problem, even, even as you increase probability of introduction, if your mitigations are good, you're still going to hit, you're still going to have less transmission or not less transmission. You're still going to be, you're not going to be seeing the, the increases of transmission that we worry about that we talk about. So Dr. Teigen, you mentioned that um, in our child care uh, that's been utilizing our schools, we haven't had a uh, teacher to student transmission or student to student transmission or student to teacher transmission. Is that correct? Did I hear I you correctly? Correct, correct. I don't know oh. of any. They have reported to me when they had cases and none of the cases. It was always community, someone, a community spread coming into the classroom and then through contact tracing and being able to have people quarantine, we had no spread. You know, even though we put people out, 
you know, that's a that's a given with contact tracing. You're likely to have people that are put out on, you know, um, for extended time, but there was not spread to those individuals. So it wasn't really an outbreak because remember, an outbreak is one person to another person within that school environment. Right. And does the concentration of students in the it, it, that are in the child care in our schools are, are the, is that similar to the concentration of students that would be in our classrooms? Um, yes, I would say based on the number we would have coming back that it's it's you know they have they may even have more, but they're still following our health plan and all of our mitigation efforts. They they've been using exactly what our teachers use and will use. Thank you. You know, when I look at all these pieces, we've had to we've been listening to our health professionals and our health committee, you know, all along the way. You know, I'm a professional educator. You know, none of us up here are um, doctors, uh, medical doctors, I should say. And, you know, so, you know, we really have been listening to our, our vetted health experts. You can find anybody saying anything on the Internet, and I understand that. But when we look at our vetted health experts that have been um, advising us, we really have to trust them. And, you know, we've watched, I mean, think of the journey we've been on since July. We've watched as our understanding of the virus and transmission has changed. As with that, the, those, the metrics have changed too. And I know that it's frustrating for our community. It's frustrating for me, but you know, we have to keep the metrics up to be our best understanding and we have to trust our health experts on that. And so we started in July with pretty much no metrics and then we moved to the burden metric and then we moved to uh, the school metrics from the VDH. And now we're understanding as we nuance those metrics, now our health experts are telling us that we need to be putting more focus on in building mitigation. And I know for some People, that sounds scary because it's not what we've been hearing, but I have to trust that, you know, the health experts. And so, you know, I know we have a really good mitigation strategy in place. I am really excited that our people are being able to get the vaccine. And so I look forward to continuing this discussion on the 28th to see, um, you know, see where we are with the vaccine and, and how we can get our students uh, back in school uh, and um, back in the building, I should say, because school never stopped. Um, and tr really trust our health experts, which uh, which I am not. Uh, and so, um, Dr. Cashel, I would ask uh, if we continue on the timeline that we are, um, I would really like to see some additional in-person in supports for our students. Um, until we're able to uh, put everybody back in the building. Um, for our students who are struggling, whether that be academically and or social emotionally. And um, I, I think we need to offer kind of more rigorous in-person supports uh, for these students. Mrs. Shea, I'll respond to that. Absolutely. We, um, our, our team overseeing our school leaders and working directly with our schools centrally have been working with our principals to um, help them understand how it is a priority just even beyond the groups we've already targeted. So early childhood, ELL, our CTE courses have already been engaging in a high level of limited in-person instruction on a regular basis since September, but looking at increasing it beyond those groups. And I know that's already happened in a number of our buildings, but particularly this um, additional delay has caused us to double down on that effort and look at how we can offer opportunities in a limited fashion to students in person beyond the original groups targeted. Yeah, thank you. And I think when we look at this, um, I think we need to lean heavily uh, listening to our teachers as the individual students because no one knows, you know, no one from our school system knows our students like their teachers who truly care about these students and know what they need. And we have to look beyond just typical classifications of who might need what and truly look at the student and lit and have our teachers tell us you know, who is who is struggling um, and who needs um, who needs some extra in person support, whether again, whether it be academically or a social emotional connection. I know I've had a lot of parents reach out to me um, 
kind of on both sides of the fence. Um, I think ADHD is a, a great um, suggest or a great example. Some parents with students with ADHD have reached out and said, "Virtual school is the best my student has ever been doing. It is a great fit for them. They are thriving." This is what they've needed all along. Well, I've also had parents reach out to me whose student has ADHD and say, "My, we can't do this at all. This is so hard. This is the hard. So, um, you know, I think we can't just look at 504 plans or IEP plans. We really have to look at the individual student, even a student who may not have uh, the any, um, you know, may not have a 504 to say who is struggling, who needs help even if it's not academically and it's social emotionally. I'll yield. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Anybody, um, any other board members have a comment? Thank you, Dr. Teigen and um, Dr. Vare and um, Ms. Gilbert for your um, report. It is, uh, it's an exciting time in, a, in, in, a, in such a bad environment which we've been in to have something positive and I don't want to use the word positive, uh, something exciting to look forward to as, as, as having our staff uh, inoculated is amazing. And I, I think our nurses are heroes for being willing to uh, m do this mass inoculation. If you, um, it, we're setting the bar once again high for our staff and I, I'm just excited that we're able to, to do this and, pull, and hopefully next week we'll be pulling it off and that gives the teachers the protection that they need in order to get back in the classroom. And, and you know, we have uh, been supporting our staff for so long and the staff has just been working so hard to make all of this happen for our students that I feel like we're finally seeing the light at the end of a very long tunnel. And while I know our community is hurting and our community is really ready to get back in the classroom, I, I think we have, um, we have got to prioritize getting our, our teachers vaccinated. So I'm excited that this will happen. And at our next board meeting, I am hoping we will be laying out a timeline for returning to the classroom, getting um, our students, especially the ones who, um, who need it, to be back in the classroom and, and begin to move forward out of this uh, long nightmare that we've all been a part of. Uh, but anyway, thank you again, Dr. Kaigan. Does anybody else have a comment before we move forward with our agenda? Okay. Um, we Ms. Ogburn, have, I, yes. Ms. Ogburn, Ms. Ogburn, I don't have a comment as much as just to, to ask one question about another question about vaccinations. Sure. The timing of it, um, we won't really discuss any of the timing until the 28th. Am I correct? What, what I meant was uh, when we meet on the 28th, uh, it is my understanding that all the vaccinations hopefully will be concluded and we will get an update from our staff uh, on how that went. I mean, what we're waiting on is the promise of a vaccine to be delivered right. this week. And, you know, things happen and we're hopeful that that happens. Um, but it's my understanding, Dr. Kaigan and or Dr. Cash will correct me if I'm wrong, that at the next meeting, we will have an update on how it went. For the first administration. Right, exactly. Yes, right. just wanted to clarify. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the, so the timeline, when will a timeline be released or discussed, potentially released to the public about any return expansion of um, in-person learning? Dr. Cashwell, do you want to address that? Certainly. So, uh, you know, as as Dr. Teigen just said, we have a timeline laid out that we're hopeful we'll be able to maintain. And I think Dr. Veray pointed out that it includes even getting the actual vaccine in hand. So we will certainly be updating the board uh, between now and the 28th, but the intention uh, on that progress um, and, and any changes there. But hope to be able to have a discussion with this board on the uh, at the 28th meeting in relation to where we are, where we see next steps and uh, the timeline uh, going forward. Okay, and, and, so does that and then, then yeah. yes, that does in other words, my we question. Wouldn't, yeah, we wouldn't be releasing a timeline uh, before then. We need to get through that next step to know more. 
this is Alicia. I did have a question earlier. I referenced a few questions um, that I had specifically on the clinical side, making sure that we have um, physicians available. Of course, nurses have to be under physicians in order to disseminate. A and uh, the other question was around understanding the admin processes, administrative processes that come into play when we have sort of this enormous effort. So those questions um, I was expecting an answer for um, on the 28th. So I want to make sure I understand answers. When will the answers to those questions happen? I think that it's important to have the answers to those questions. Uh, prior to the 28th, to be honest, um, now that I'm understanding, have a better understanding of what's going to be shared on the 28th. Uh, can you help me understand how that information will be shared to board members? Because that's a critical piece of the entire process, understanding the specific roles that our nurses play, the position that they will be under, the liabilities that take place um, or hopefully won't take place, making sure, you know, is the nurse also responsible for monitoring adverse reactions after giving the shot and will a physician be on site? So those are the questions that I have. They're probably a little bit clinical, a little bit administrative, all falling under the medical umbrella. So are we going to get that before the 28th or is that uh, something that we'll talk about offline? We can talk uh, about well, offline we as we have. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to speak at the same time. I was just going to say, certainly, I hear your questions, Mrs. Atkins, and we can work uh, certainly to provide you the detailed answers you've asked for um, subsequent to this meeting. I, I don't have uh, some of that information on hand, and I want to be able to give you the most thorough answer possible, and it certainly can be before the 28th. We can get back to you. And, Dr. and Ms. Atkins, just to follow up on what you said, I would imagine that that information would also be shared with employees as to um, you know what's going to be in place when they come to get vaccinated because they're going to need to know um, is there going to be assistance for anyone you know and what kind of supports are there for employees i think that's part of the process would it not be it will be sorry it's melissa again okay so, so that's part of the um oh sorry Go ahead. as to our staff and to the public actually i would think it um as part of the process Am I right? So, yeah, I'm not. It's Melissa again. I don't have all of those details in front of me right now. I do know that um, they are being worked out with count between county and, H and HCPS right now and making sure those are all laid out. And it's actually a fair amount of it's being laid out um, in the planning process. So I and while we could bore the public with it, <laughs> I don't know if they want all of it. Um, I think um, that should not be problematic to have for you guys offline. I'm just not poised right now. And there may still be some pieces that are being laid out in terms of roles and things like that. Um, but but I, don't, I don't see that as being a problem to share before next meeting. But obviously I should, I should probably let Robin speak to that. <laughs> and I think that the incident, the regional incident management team, they're still pulling together and finalizing plans. I mean, they've done an amazing job in two, you know, not even two days to have pulled together what they have, but we'll share more information as we know it from the incident management team. But I can assure you that all T's will be crossed and I's will be dotted before we proceed. And so that I can assure you of Ms. Atkins. Absolutely. Mrs. Shea, did you have another question? Yeah, this might be for uh, uh, Somewhat, whoever on the team, maybe Ms. Gilbert. Uh, so I've gotten a lot of questions around what will our nurses' roles be between the two doses, between giving our staff the two doses of employ of uh, vaccine. So the nursing staff, when if, while we're not vaccinating right now, um, we will be back in the schools tending to the children. They're there doing limited in person. Um, we're still following up with students that will be returning to us, hopefully in the very, very near future, because we miss them terribly, um, making sure we have everything in place for them to return their health plans. We're participating in IEP and 504 meetings um, to ensure their, their readiness. Um, and like I said, we do have students in school, so we are tending to their needs. Yeah, and they, they will be giving the vaccines over this course as well. 
Any other questions, board members? Uh, Ms. Kinsella and Ms. Atkins, did you have plenty of opportunity to add to your questions that you had? Ms. Kinsella, did you have another one? I thought you might. I wanted to be sure. I did. I had one in terms of, and I'm sorry if it's been addressed, but my audio is going in and in and out today. Um, do we have we heard about the hierarchy if there is one for employees to get vaccinated? Um, because I know I, I know I've received quite a few comments about how is that going to work, and I, I know that's as to some of what Ms. Atkins is saying. But if it's just a yes no. Um, can anyone yes. answer that, please? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we, we have. We have gone through our staff and there's been a hierarchy determined based on um, their current work and their expected work. And so HR has been working through that with school leadership um, to help identify those individuals. And so per, okay. per the request of the health department, we have prioritized. Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you. Thank you. And then I'll just wait a bit, um, and, and let our frequently asked our FAQ come out frequently asked questions um, cover some of the other um, deep, more detailed items of concern. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Madam Chair. OK, thank you, Ms. Catella. Um, and thank you to the uh, Health Committee. 